Portman joins me now. Thank you so much for joining me. I know you heard my interview with Brian Deese, uh, the president's top economic advisor. I talked to him about the letter that you and nine other Republicans sent this morning. What do you uh, what do you think about that? What's your reaction to what he said? Well, first, thank you for the interview. It's the first time I've heard the administration say they, you know, they want to actually make good on the promises made in the inaugural address with regard to COVID-19. So you, you made progress. Thank you. Uh, I mean, seriously, it is extraordinary to me that you have uh, a great speech, which I said at the time uh, at the inaugural, talking about the need to heal and the need for us to work together as a country, Republican and Democrat alike, and a pledge to do more outreach to Republicans. And then uh, the next day, landing on our desks, you know, a $1.9 trillion COVID-19 package, uh, when only a month ago we passed a $900 billion COVID-19 package that was entirely bipartisan. This one, uh, nobody was consulted, including the Democrats on our bipartisan group uh, that compiled the previous bill. And, you know, frankly, we haven't gotten much of a, uh, of, a, of a response yet until today. So thank you. And it's true that this morning we sent out a letter to the president saying we would love to work with him. It's signed by 10 Republicans. It specifies the proposal that, that we think is more targeted and, and more appropriate for the times we're in. And my hope is the president will meet with us and we'll be able to work out something that is bipartisan. So we've done it five times. You know, we, we've had five COVID-19 packages that are entirely bipartisan. Let's let's do it again, because that's what would be best for the country. So, Senator, I have the letter here. Uh, it does lay out general ideas, some specifics, but not a lot. Can you give us a, a ballpark of how much you're willing to spend in this whole package you're proposing? Well, it'll be less than 1.9 because much of what uh, the administration has laid out has nothing to do with COVID-19. And in fact, some of it uh, is not even responsive to the issues uh, that Mr. Deese raised. As an example, uh, with regard to the direct payments, we think they should be much more targeted. $50,000 cap for individuals, for, as an example, 100000 for a family. And uh, right now, if you look at the administration's plan, you could have a family with three kids uh, making almost 300000 bucks a year getting a check. And many of these people have had no impact from COVID. In fact, some are doing quite well. Others are struggling. Let's focus on those who are struggling. You made the good point a moment ago that all the economic analysis has come in saying that uh, those who make over, let's say, 75000 bucks a year uh, are tending not to spend the money, but rather save it. In other words, it's not being used for the intended purpose. So let's target it. We really want to help those who need it the most. And at a time of unprecedented deficits and debts, and a debt as a percentage of the economy is as high as it's been in our nation's history since World War II, we need to be sure this is targeted. Uh, second, so with regard to unemployment insurance, you know, they have a program that takes it until September. We don't know what the economy is going to look like uh, between now and September. Most economists believe next year will be uh, significant growth, over 4% growth. So, uh, so let's target that a little bit more and make sure that it is, is tied somewhat to the economic conditions. Okay, so those are, are two examples. You spoke to President Biden on the phone this week. Did you talk about any of this? Well, I, I had a very nice call from uh, President Biden regarding my decision not to run again in two years, and I appreciated that. Uh, I, I don't talk about what I talked to, to uh, the president about, but I will say it was a nice conversation. I did raise the issue, but my, my hope is that, again, the inaugural address will not just be uh, good rhetoric, but actually be practiced. And I think it's really in the, in the interest of the Biden administration not to do what the Democrats on the Hill are planning to do, which is on Tuesday, as you know, start to go uh, down the road of a process that will jam Republicans and really jam the country because with a bare 50 vote majority, remember they have the 50-50 Senate now, so it's, it's divided right in half, right. that they would use what's called reconciliation. And basically what it says is you ignore the interests of the of the minority party and just jam it through. And it's not in the interest of the party, uh, of the Democratic Party to do that, in my view, because it will set uh, President Biden down a path of partisanship well, that I think will poison the well for other bipartisanship we'll, we'll need on so many issues. Well, uh, you mentioned uh, poisoning the well. I, I just have to ask you, because you did support Republican efforts to use reconciliation on a few things, like trying to repeal the Affordable Care Act, passing the Trump tax cuts. So explain why it was OK for Republicans, but not Democrats. Well, I, reconciliation is, is a tool that you're able to use. It has to relate directly to the budget. And what the Democrats are talking about doing is, one, using it right off the bat without you know, trying to come up with a bipartisan compromise as we have on COVID-19. If you can't find bipartisanship on COVID-19, I don't know where you can find it. You know, Our proposal, as an example, is going to have all of the health care funding that, that President 
Biden has in his proposal, all of it. So there's, there's a lot of bipartisanship. But second, reconciliation is not meant for the purposes that they're trying to use it for. They would have to get rid of what's called the bird rule, which keeps it to the budget. In other words, everything has to be directly related to the budget. Um, and, and so that would change the rules of the Senate. Yeah. So it wouldn't be uh, the old reconciliation. It would be a new reconciliation. They've well, been very clear about that. Okay. You know how that works. But this is, essentially it's getting rid of the filibuster if you get rid of the bird rule, okay. which you know, is a huge change in our country and will lead I, to less bipartisanship, not more. Yeah, and I, and I want our, our, our viewers to stay awake <laughs> while we talk about the uh, inner workings of the Senate. <laughs> uh, but I do want to move on to impeachment. Uh, you voted this week to dismiss the trial as unconstitutional since Donald Trump is no longer in office. I know you've said you're going to keep an open mind as a juror, but setting aside questions of timing or constitutionality, do you consider Trump's actions leading up to and on January 6th to be impeachable conduct? Yes or no? Yeah. First of all, Dana, that was not Dana. That, that was not the vote. I mean, the vote was to table a discussion about the constitutionality. Right. And so, I said so, from the separate, start, I think so separate. So separate from that. that has to be discussed. Yeah. So I just wanted to put that, so that aside, was, that, but I want to focus. The vote, the, vote was, the vote was not about dismissing the trial. It was about not discussing the constitutionality. Okay. Is, a, is a critical issue. I have said with regard to the president's comments that day that they were partly responsible for what happened, for the horrible violence that occurred on Capitol Hill. I've also said, you know, that, that, that what he did was, was, was wrong and, and inexcusable. I've used the word inexcusable because I think that's, that's how I feel. So, I mean, we'll see. I'm a, I'm a juror. I'm going to keep an open mind as we go through this. Uh, but I do think that this constitutionality issue has to be addressed. I mean, we would be convicting a private citizen, as you know, someone who's out of office. That sets a, a, a precedent. And I think all former presidents, yeah. <laughs> those alive and those and those not, uh, uh, could could be affected in a negative way. But if you don't vote yes, that, aren't you excusing that, it? You say it's inexcusable. If you don't vote yes, one could argue that you are doing just that. You are excusing the behavior. Well, it can be inexcusable and yet not be uh, subject to a conviction after a president has left office. If you look at the Constitution, and there aren't that many words about impeachment, so it's easy to do, and I encourage your viewers to do so. It's always connected with removal from office. And this is why the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court uh, refuses to come and preside over this trial, as he did in the last one, because he says, as he looks at the Constitution, he only comes when it's about removal, uh, which is you know, what impeachment calls for. So I think it's a question we have to discuss, and we have to you know, come up with a precedent for the future. Okay, so uh, I'm sure you've seen the news that CNN broke last night. All five members of former President Trump's impeachment team quit. And there's just a week until this trial begins. CNN's reporting is that they left amid a disagreement over strategy because Trump wanted them to argue the election was stolen. What does that say to you about the former president, that he's still trying to perpetuate the lie, the very lie that led to the insurrection in the first place? Well, let, let me just say clearly, and I've said this, as you know, since November, uh, which is that there was not adequate irregularities uh, or fraud not widespread enough to change the result of the election, period. That's my view. It's the view, by the way, of the Trump Department, of the Trump Justice Department. Uh, Bill Barr said that before uh, he left office. And so I think we need to be very clear with the American people. Those who voted for Donald Trump, and I you know, was a Trump supporter, and I think his policies were better for the country and better for my state, uh, we have to acknowledge that this election was lost, and we have to move on. And Joe Biden is now the duly elected president of the United States. So if the argument is not going to be made on issues like constitutionality, which are real issues and yeah. need to be addressed, I think it will not, not benefit the president. You are now the third Senate Republican planning to retire after 2022, along with Richard Burr and Pat Toomey. Uh, your party is facing a reckoning right now. People who are telling lies, like you were just talking about, pushing conspiracy theories, they're getting louder and louder. So isn't your silence or eventually your absence from uh, you know, the party from someone like you going to make the party veer even more towards people who spew conspiracies and lies? Well, I don't plan to be silent. Uh, first of all, I've been doing this a long time, as you know, and you and I have known each other a long time, 30 years off and on, and I never intended to stay as long as I have, to be honest. I, I'm, I'm not big on uh, career politicians. I, I think it's, it's good to go in and out of office. So I'm looking forward to getting back to the private sector and the nonprofit sector and helping more on the outside. But I, I don't plan to be silent. Uh, and I do think, you know, we, we, we have a good chance as a Republican Party to pull together and to do what we did in 2020, with the exception of the presidential race. Uh, you know, Republicans did very well. 
uh, gained 14, maybe 15 seats in the House of Representatives, which no one expected. Did very well in the Senate seats compared to what was expected. Uh, took over three new uh, st state houses, so and in Ohio, particularly, we, we did very well. So I think the Republican Party is on sound footing if we focus well, on the policies, because people, people trust us there, and, oh. and we have the right policies in terms of economic growth and strong military and, and energy independence and so on. So that's, that's where the party ought to focus. Okay, so having said that, I want to ask about Liz Cheney. You have been very close with the Cheney family for decades. Right now, Republicans are not focused entirely on the policies. People like former President Trump, some of Liz Cheney's colleagues, are trying to punish her for voting to impeach President Trump. How do you respond to that? Well, she is a friend. I'm, I'm biased. Uh, I think she's uh, very smart and she plays a, a key role in our party, particularly on foreign affairs. So I, I would hope that they would not go down that, that road. I think it's it's important to have her voice uh, in the in the process. And, you know, my sense is that she has a lot of support in the Republican conference. I'm in the Senate, not the House and House yeah. members, uh, as I used to be, hate to have the senators tell them what to do. But the truth is, I think she's very valuable for the for the team and, and a great so, leader. So I know you're in the Senate, not the House. You were in the House for a long time. Um, this isn't about telling them what to do. This is a question about, uh, I think, right and wrong. And this is about Marjorie Taylor Greene, who, as you know, believes uh, the dangerous QAnon conspiracy theory. She spread anti-Semitic conspiracies, claimed school shootings are false flag operations and so on. Um, she has so far faced zero repercussions from uh, what she has, has said and the ideas that she is, is spewing. So as a Republican leader who does not want to be silent, do you think that she should be punished or somehow uh, it should be shown that she is an example of how that kind of stuff is not tolerated in the GOP? Yeah, I think Republican leaders ought to stand up and say it is totally unacceptable what she has said. I saw a couple of the videos uh, over the weekend and you know, one had to do with, with violence, as, as I see it. And there, there's no place for violence in our political dialogue. By the way, there's no place in viol for violence in our country. <laughs> I mean, this is something that we gotta, gotta get away from. So yeah, I, I, I think people ought to speak out clearly. Should she be stripped I'm not of one her of committee the House assignment? Leaders, but I, I, well, I assume that's something that they're looking at, and um, I wouldn't be surprised if that happens. And you know, I think that's, that's the way to send a message. The, the voters who elected her in her district in, in Georgia, uh, you know, ought to be respected. On the other hand, when that kind of behavior occurs, there has to be a, a strong response. Senator Rob Portman, a lot to get through, which we did this morning. Really appreciate it. And thank you so much for joining me. Thanks, Dana. Always great to be on with you. Take care. Thank you.